sitting against a rock at the Atlantic Ocean, looking out from West Donegal at the islands of Tory, Inishnamaro, Critch, Larrenmore. And it's very beautiful here at this hour of the morning. It's just 10 minutes past nine. And I just come here because of two reasons. One, it's spring and the light comes sooner and you get up earlier and you go for a walk. Now, I don't do it every day. I don't do it very often. But when I do it, I'd be sitting here saying to myself, why don't I do it every morning? This is the way to live, to be up early. I always remember the Dalai Lama being asked one time, as a, I was watching him on the television and he was doing an interview. And somebody said, you know, in, after a lot of complicated teachings, somebody said, you know, Dalai Lama, how, how do I become a Buddhist? He said, get up early in the morning, that's all. Buddhism is just awakening early. And the awakening early that you do physically on the outside goes on on the inside. It begins to put an imprint, as they would say in, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, an imprint, a karmic imprint, begins to develop out of habit. And that imprint gets deeper and deeper, and that's a very, very good imprint, imprint to reshape your consciousness and your mind and move you forward into the bardo and into the next experience of life that you will experience in the cycle of life because everything is a cycle everything goes round and round the seasons go round i was here last summer in may i'm here again endlessly it continues even though i physically may wither get older get stiffer get sicker and then pass away there's something that is the source of my consciousness the the wider level beyond what is the ego that's what is here that's what i bring here but it's also what i meet when i'm here i meet the presence as other the presence as other in the sea in the ocean in the dolphins in the wild birds above me at the minute and i meet it if i meet a human being i'd say god bless you because i know that that person is bringing to me the presence bringing to me god god's grace and I don't achieve God's grace in my own ability. It's always coming to me. And that, I think, is the key threshold point between meditation and contemplation. And I encourage you to believe that it's not difficult. It is not rocket science. This is so accessible, so easy to do. And it incorporates everything that you're already doing. In other words, if you do yoga, if you do Tai Chi, if you do meditation or mindfulness at any level, you are building a karmic imprint. You're making yourself stronger and stronger in the sense of presence within you, in the sense of self-awareness and awareness to the mystery of what is within you, living within you. So everything, all roads lead to the same place. And when you're full of joy and happiness and brightness, that helps you to get there. And then when you're full of anguish and grief and sorrow and fear because maybe you're ill, that gets you there too. All roads lead to this threshold of awakening, of contemplation, of being in the presence you name it in all sorts of different ways and I've noticed over the past two years since I begun this beautiful adventure for me to be honest with you this has been a real blessing for me at a time of COVID and a time of illness to be able to talk to you I mean it's like such a gift that you are to me such a gift I, it's I couldn't have planned this I couldn't have imagined it even five years ago but the more I got into it, I realized I was drifting from, you know, trying to do a podcast as a, a clever, established writer, a playwright, a storyteller. I realized I was drifting all the time back to the old secret disposition of my heart, which was religious. And that scared me because I felt, well, you know, sometimes religion in the modern world looks like it's 
just not a good idea, not a good place to go, not a free place for a writer to be. Sometimes I think like that the people that propagandize about religion, that try and put forward religious ideas are constantly doing it about morality and about legalism and about, you know, pointing at other people who are bad. And I thought, God, I don't want to be part of the people who wag their fingers because, you know, you'd need to be deaf and blind not to hear and see in the Gospels the consistent and persistent voice of Jesus saying, you know, people who get hung up on religiosity are like hypocrites. They're like painted tombs. They're white on the outside and they're rotten inside. He says, he keeps saying, don't judge other people. Leave it to God to judge. And um, he also says, don't throw the first stone. And he says, don't, you know, don't look at the speck in your neighbor's eye. Look at the mold. Like, it's just it's just a full, clear rhythm of saying, liberate yourself from the righteousness of religion. Enter into the poverty of being here now and awaken. And to be honest with you, I don't know much about all these religions. I'm not a scholar and I'm not a teacher, but in my experience, I've seen the same thing in the beautiful scriptures of Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism. It's all there. So there's two reasons why I come here today, this morning, and share it with you. One is, one is because it's still Easter. Easter tide goes on for 40 days, and I'd encourage you, don't let go of Easter yet. There's some very beautiful dramas that happened over the Easter weekend, and they happened in real time in history. And I think that for a couple of weeks afterwards, the people that were close to Jesus and loved him, his mother and his companion Mary Magdalene and all the different disciples and followers, they, they must have been in such shock. You know, like like the shock when something huge happens, some tragedy like a tsunami or a war in Ukraine. And, and like one day everything is quiet and peaceful and the next day it just goes the wrong way and you don't realize that history has taken over and and swept away all your dreams and that must have been the way that it was after the crucifixion like like they must have been sitting looking at each other saying what the fuck happened what was that about and then they begin to piece it back together and the foundation and anchor of their piecing it back together was the witness of Mary Magdalene, his companion, who stayed at the crucifixion, stayed with the mother, stayed with the burial in the tomb, and then went early in the morning and had a deep and profound metaphysical, transformative alteration in her consciousness that she could only adequately describe as having met the risen Christ. And not long after that, the same experience begin, begins to kind of repeat itself. So there's a huge shock that goes on, and they begin to rework their way back. And it maybe takes 200 years before they say things like, you know, they can see how even the birth of Jesus was like the overture, the, the, the acceptance that Mary had of the message to shelter this child in her womb that that it becomes extraordinary because of the conclusions because of Easter that's what makes all the ideas about Mary special that, and it, they are special in the sense that they're bringing a human being to the centre of that mythic narrative if you like because there's so many people say things like oh yes God you know you know, God comes as, as the word or becomes man or whatever. Or he comes down to save us, right? And that's in a whole lot of other Greek, Persian, Asian stories about the origins of the universe. But what made the, the Christian thing different and unique is that it was man. It was a human being born of a woman with all 
involved a kind of sense of fragility and vulnerability. So that when you think about Jesus in the Gospels in the day, days and weeks and years before Easter, you're, you're not thinking of some sort of super being from Star Wars who's you know floating around in this costume called Jesus. You're really talking about a real man who's as real as uh, Gandhi or Constance Markovich or Boris Johnston or you or me. You're talking about a real human being. And whatever way he emerged and grew and whatever way he sat at the ocean would have been the Mediterranean, I suppose, near Capernaum or somewhere. But whatever way he sat on the rocks and looked out and thought about the great presence of the cosmos, hidden and invisible in the beauty of the universe, whatever way he kind of engaged with it and felt it was in his own heart, it was so strong and so powerful that he was able to model that insight and that wisdom into teachings, into stories. And I'd say when he was going up to Jerusalem at that time to celebrate what was a big religious feast with some of his close companions, I don't think that he was like, you know, clairvoyant. I don't think he knew on Palm Sunday what the fact was going to happen by the end of the week. And by the end of the week he was gone. Jesus was gone. Jesus Jesus was gone. Don't don't worry about that. He died. He died. <laughs> on the cross it wasn't a bluff but his companion Mary has a great insight Christ is risen he is the Christ the chosen one the chosen one has risen in this cataclysm in this supreme non-violent surrender to the cross and then you get the whole 2,000 years of figuring it out. I, I, I come here because of that, and I come here because of spring. And there are two big things I think is worth enjoying in the month of May. And I would say enjoy them. Enjoy the beauty and the gorgeousness of the idea that the risen Christ is, is with you, is in you is minding you, is cherishing you, and in fact, is you, like you are the only bit that can embody the Christ, and you can in every moment of your life, and then enjoy this beautiful sense that that the overture to that possibility, if there was some sort of revelation, you know, forming of the universe after whatever it was, I don't know, seven million years of, you know, sort of evolving species trying to become homo sapiens and homo sapiens struggling for 300,000 years or whatever long we've been here relatively unchanged imagine that and to think that you're here now you are the one now that embodies and that it's all cyclical, yeah, it's all going round and round. It's endless. And sometimes being at the sea, you can you can sense a longevity, a longevity that's, you know, a length of life, I should say, that's longer than my life. So it, it makes me relativize my life. When I look at the rocks, when I look at the rocks that are in front of me here, they're like the skin of an elephant. That's what the rocks look like to me always, like the skin of a great rhinoceros or something, or a sleeping giant. And there they are in front of me, and the water lapping up against them here in Donegal. And I look at these rocks, and they're sloped. They're all sloped towards the mainland. The reason being that they were, like, at some stage, a tectonic plate that moved into the landmass that is now Ireland and moved, sort of crushed up like a car would crush up against a wall if you drove a car into a, a wall. And that's why they're all sideways. All the rocks slope in the same direction because of the crash. And that was... That was 300 million years ago. 300 million years. And I'm sitting on them rocks. I'm looking at them rocks. You know, 
how transient is my life. So I'm going to do a really special podcast today. And I'm going to try and reflect on... (coughs) Excuse me. I'm going to try and reflect on something about that journey from Good Friday to Resurrection. And I'm going to do it in the context of the tomb babies. I had a beautiful, beautiful day on Wednesday. I was over in Tume and we had a little gathering because there was guys coming from Osnabrück in Germany. They'd cycled the entire way. They were led by a man called John McGork, who is from Scotland. He works in Osnabrück, but he was abused as a young child in a, a care home run by the church. And now he's he's doing creative things to not just heal himself, but to, I suppose, gather support for people who work with vulnerable children. And he gathered a huge amount of money. It was a big charity cycle. But the, the end of it, the conclusion of it was that they were cycling from Osnabrück to Tomb to lay across a wreath and to put a few prayers into the air in that what I think is now becoming a very holy place where those children it's like Golgotha you know it's like a place where there was a crucifixion and I'll go into that later but not in a dark way not in a negative way but to try and reflect on on how the Chum Baby's story might in the future have a good resolution a resolution that incorporates a sense of resurrection a sense of fulfillment and completion because it was a dark dark thing in a dark time it's like surreal in a 30 or 40 year period and their deaths are all recorded but there's no record of any burials and then what turns up in a hole in the ground but all the little babies they haven't been fully counted, itemized and DNA done yet but hopefully that will happen in the next year or two and it really is a crime scene and and hopefully all will go well exhuming the bodies and and finding a way to make a really good and powerful ritual of burial that honors them as little angels and affirms for their families that they are at peace with God. And maybe out of that, many people in Ireland will will find healing for all the wounds that we have inflicted on others and the wounds that we have endured ourselves. Now that's going to come later. And yet, what religion points at is the moon, the beautiful existential experience of making the invisible visible. And it's invisible, but it's present in you and in me. And we can feel it. And it's pure, pure joy. So I hope you have a happy day. There's another, by the way, let me just give you one last little idea. In Judaism, they have a lovely sense of tolerance. It, it comes out, believe it or not, in Fiddler on the Roof, you know, and it's a, it is a Jewish concept, and, and the basic core of it is a man hears his daughter giving one opinion about how she loves the village, and he says, you know, you're right, it is a beautiful village. And then the other daughter comes in and she gives her opinion about the village being an awful place to live and she wants to leave it and he says to her, you know, you are right, it is a very, very small village, you're better to go. And the wife who's listening in the corner says, come here to me, they can't both be right. And he looks at her and he says, you know, you are right too. Mm. And that reflects a powerful wisdom, I think it's it's deeply Jewish and I think it flows through European philosophy as a counterpoint to righteousness and a counterpoint to certitude and that is the notion that things are true as far as they go if the truth 
that you hold gets you through the day. That's what it's that's what it's useful for. It's like a boat. It's like a boat. Religion is like a boat. The truth is like a boat. It's something you embody, something that gets you across the river. It's not something it's not something you walk around you don't walk around with a boat on your head. You use it. And so whatever your truth is, if it gets you through the day, which means allows you to be present in every moment of the day in a joyful way, if that's what your mentor deity does, then rejoice because your heart is opening. And uh, I'm, I'm thanking you for being here. I, I'm feeling like you're really here now, here at the ocean. So thank you. Bye-bye.